All right, well, good afternoon. Thank you all very much for joining our virtual meetup through the Northwest Tennessee Local Food Network. We are very excited about today's presentation. Dan and Nadia Spatz began farming in 2012 um, when they purchased their greenhouse operation out of Eagleville, Tennessee. Um, and Dan's family um, is part of a, a long row of farmers in Arkansas. And he's gonna share uh, with us today his experience out of Conway, Arkansas and sourcing um, purple hull peas to schools. Uh, but before we get started with that, um, a few announcements. Uh, the Northwest Tennessee Local Food Network, we are a nonprofit based out of Martin, Tennessee out of Wakely County. We serve uh, nine counties so far um, in Northwest Tennessee and we are always looking to expand opportunities to engage and to learn. Um, and our mission is to catalyze actions that are increasing access to locally grown foods in an equitable and sustainable way. Um, our ultimate goal is to create thriving communities that are centralized around um, the creation of sustainable local food systems that support not only healthy communities, but also create a thriving local economy, um, that circular economy going on. Um, one of the opportunities that we have right now is an advocacy opportunity. We are encouraging everyone to go to our website, nwtnlfn.org, um, check out our blog. There is information to um, support school nutrition programs through the Universal School um, Lunch Program. This funding right now is set to be cut off in June. And so we are, we have organized um, a postcard writing campaign for everybody um, to take part of. All of the resources are downloadable, you can out postcards, and um, specifically for Tennessee legislatures, we have all of their contact information, and there's also an online um, petition form link. If you don't have time to do postcards, you can at least have a couple minutes to uh, fill out the online petition and advocate for um, increasing funding and keeping funding for the Universal Free School Meals Program. There's more information on our website. Again, you can visit nwtnlfn.org. Check out our blog. All of the information is there. <clears throat> so without further delay. I'm posting that right now in the thank chat. You, thank you, Caroline. Really easy to do. Um, and every, every voice counts. So the more we can advocate for this program, the better off for all of us because kids need food. Um, and their families do too, indirectly. By feeding children, we are also supporting our families in all of our communities. So without further delay, um, we have Dan Spatz with us today. And um, Dan and I met rather, um, maybe it was a coincidence or it was just destiny, I don't know. You can name it whatever you ha have, but um, Dan and I have um, engaged with each other uh, over the course of the year, Caroline and I went to go visit his farm after the Pitt Tennessee conference, and it was amazing. Um, and we are just really excited to have Dan because he has an excellent story to share with you and inspiration that local foods into schools can be done. And Dan's going to tell us how he did it. So Dan, you've got the floor. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Samantha and, and Carolyn and, uh, for inviting me and uh, having the opportunity to share the story. I, uh, what, what was the title of this? Uh, one P's Journey or something uh, like power that? Power of a Purple Whole P and One P's Journey in two there. central Arkansas school meals. <laughs> Love it. Power um, of getting not just food, but good food, right? The, the right food that uh, we want our children to, to have access uh, to. And uh, for the sake of uh, this presentation, I'm the P, right? So uh, this was this was uh, my journey or, or our journey um, uh, to um, basically implement a, a farm to school grant, and um, uh, it uh, it really resulted out of my desire, a, a very socially entrepreneurial desire, to transform what has been a classic row crop operation in Central Arkansas. Uh, into something that uh, is, uh, well, serving a, a higher purpose, uh, a more generative uh, social purpose um, is, the, uh, is the way um, I like to think about it. And um, for uh, the group here, and I'm going to start sharing my screen, um, just to ground us all, I was looking at the map uh, a little bit earlier of, of, of Martin, 
um, where presumably a number of you are in the region and just admiring how much uh, farmland uh, you've obviously got around the, the Tennessee and Mississippi rivers, right? You're, um, you're kind of defined by that, uh, that area. And so where we're going over here is down to the Southwest and it's actually easier to, um, to see here. So we're going down uh, past Jonesboro and uh, in the Little Rock area, just north, um, north and west is Conway. And our geography here is very much shaped by the Arkansas River uh, that you saw meandering um, here. And then, uh, and then the farm is, uh, the farm we're talking about here is west of Conway in an area that we call the, the Lolly Bottoms. Um, it's, it's sandwiched between a growing city uh, of Conway. It's about 70,000 uh, people now. And, um, and, and then you see what's happening here and um, the city is growing to the west. It's growing towards the river. And, and this is our farm right in here. So we already have the airport on, on one side and uh, one of the challenges I faced in this transition or, or even in the, in the decision to kind of just continue the classic row crop uh, situation is our taxes keep going up, right? The city's moving in our direction. And, um, you know, on, a, on a, a very global scale, we're losing a lot of our farmland to this kind of development. And so I figured a couple of years ago, if I didn't find a, a better, different economic uh, solution, you know, we would be challenged as a family um, and, and so on and so forth. So, you know, it, it, it is definitely about getting uh, better nutrition into the, into the kids, but um, mutuality is, is strong in my world. And when you can do that in a way that um, allows you as well to, to wind up better off economically, to me, that's, um, that's just win, win, win. So I wanna start off here uh, with a, a presentation about uh, our farm to school program. And this is kind of a, uh, a timed uh, animation thing. We were, we were playing it for the nutrition directors when they got together in September uh, last year for the, uh, for the taste testing. Um, you're seeing the partners uh, that came together on this. Uh, this was a farm to school program funded by the USDA and I can give you more uh, of the specifics about that um, in a minute. Um, we were very much uh, motivated by this problem in society. In Arkansas, we're number five in childhood uh, obesity uh, and number three in adult obesity. Uh, so, you know, the, the trends and, and behaviors and health habits get established early. Uh, and in Arkansas, you know, the the type of food we're eating that's driving that obesity just continues to accelerate um, into, uh, into adulthood. Um, farm to school, our vision is very much about collect, connecting the classroom and the community with the, the cafeteria. Um, you see our vision here um, really is health centric and, and the um, farming entity that uh, I've got over in Arkansas, we call it Healthy Flavors Arkansas for a reason and it is all about health. Um, and you see some of the different uh, visuals and uh, some of the different uh, statistics about, about our program. I partnered with the University of Central Arkansas in this endeavor, and they've been great. Uh, they're a uh, faculty of nutrition and, um, um, and, and family um, science has been uh, really awesome here. Uh, and then we, we won the grant without really knowing what schools we were gonna partner with and Greenbrier, Valonia and Mayflower uh, they're not they're they're on the outskirts of Conway, but they've been awesome, and it's been wonderful to start a, a program where we didn't really know what we were doing getting into it with some smaller schools um, because, again, our yields have not been um, what they could have been or where we want them to be. But um, we also didn't overextend ourselves from the um, expectation perspective. So uh, we define local as within a 50 mile radius, um, and so. Uh, the Lolly Bottoms, where our farm is located in that Arkansas River Valley, is, um, is definitely going to cover uh, Faulkner County for sure and, and a central Arkansas region. And then in Arkansas, we call ourselves the natural state. So we kind of played on that a little bit. And um, what we're talking about is natural food here, right? The, the healthiest food is the food that we can um, consume in as uh, minimally touched uh, way as possible. 
and this was a little bit of inspiration. We're also proud in Arkansas of Sam Walton. Uh, he was a, an innovator early on, and he had these bold ideas where people in the in the beginning really questioned the wisdom, um, but he practiced and improved, persevered, and I think that's something in a farm to school context um, we can learn from. And uh, even if our uh, ambition isn't as big as his uh, his vision proved out to be, um, you know, it takes a lot when you're uh, when you're starting. Uh, on a small scale uh, to, to basically uh, try to grow something um, because we know the, the vision of, of getting healthy foods to our kids is pretty audacious. We spent, we spent a, a good hundred years uh, developing a system that, that leads to the kind of trends I talked about earlier. And, and so um, hopefully it doesn't take 50, doesn't take a hundred years to, to, um, to, to reverse that trend. And, and, and I think we are kind of compelled to work at a, at a faster pace. Um, so, so yeah, the, the USDA uh, farm to school program, I became aware of it in the fall of 2020, uh, pretty quickly uh, assembled uh, a coalition of people who were um, very helpful in, in advising me. Uh, the Arch Board Educational Cooperative was one of them. Um, nutrition and Family Sciences, Dr. Niner Roof at UCA was very encouraging from the very beginning. Um, and, uh, and then I knew I had um, enough support from local school districts, but, but we didn't propose a firm commitment with any, any school districts. Uh, and I worried about that early on, right? I mean, how's that gonna be perceived from the grant perspective? But um, the, uh, the grant was basically to um, on the farm, um, purchase 70% of a pea picker, which I knew I had to have to kind of um, make this feasible. We don't have a lot of labor, a lot of, a lot of purple hole peas in the Delta get, get handpicked, but I knew we really didn't have that option. Um, they funded 70% of, the, of, a, of a freezer, of a walk-in freezer that we're actually still building. Um, and uh, that's necessary because we, we need to freeze the peas and to bridge the harvest in September, October with you know, the ability to, to serve the peas all, all winter long, um, eventually. And, uh, and they, uh, they also funded 70% of a sheller. So they basically set up our farm to, uh, to be um, in, in, the, in the pea business. And uh, then they funded the graduate assistants at, at UCA to, to do the recipe development, uh, do the uh, list lesson plan uh, development. So uh, we were, were really investing uh, in that capability. Uh, we targeted the third grade, the seventh grade and the 10th graders in each of the schools. Um, and I'm gonna show you here in a moment, a video that uh, that we produced to basically um, get some messages uh, across about the peas that were uh, ultimately served. Um, we started in February in Greenbrier and uh, we continued it with, with Valonia in art and even Mayflower is still kind of in the midst of implementing the program. So let me, those are a few of the um, details about the Farm to School Grant. Let me switch over now to a video. And um, this video is what the students saw as part of their, uh, and I need to make sure you can hear the um, audio here. This is what they saw as a part of their lesson plans. My name is Dan Spatz and I am with Healthy Flavors Arkansas. Healthy Flavors Arkansas is a farming enterprise located west of Conway in this area that we like to call the Lolly Bottoms. And this farm and the soil I'm standing on was shaped by the Arkansas River, it's just a few hundred feet over here. And because the soil is so rich here, long time ago, many farmers came to this area and they started growing crops. 
So Healthy Flavors Arkansas has partnered with your school district in what we call a farm to school program. What is farm to school? I like to think of it this way. 100, 200 years ago in America, many people grew up on a farm. They were familiar and aware of where their food came from, of how it was grown, of when it was grown, of how it was handled, how it was processed. So there was this awareness, there was this culture around food and its importance in our lives. And we've really lost a lot of that awareness. We've lost a lot of the connections. We've lost a lot of the relationships that are all about the food that we eat. So farm to school, literally, through the classroom, through the lesson plans that you're studying this week, and connecting your classroom activities to the cafeteria, where in the next couple of weeks, you're gonna have the opportunity to consume the peas that were grown right here in this field. So by connecting the classroom, what you're studying, to the food you're eating in the cafeteria, to the community, and where those foods were grown, that's what Farm to School is about. So why are we studying purple hole peas in this particular Farm to School program? Well, there are three main reasons. First of all, I chose purple hole peas because they're a Southern favorite. Everybody in the South, especially in the summertime in Arkansas, knows what a purple hole pea is. They're running out to their farmer's market stand. They're looking for uh, a way to get a purple hole pea. It's a creamy, buttery, pleasant flavor compared to other sorts of peas, and it's a Southern favorite. So people are aware, they're familiar, they know what a purple hole pea is, and I thought, what a great idea. Second of all, from the agriculture and farming perspective, Peas are a legume, and legumes are nitrogen fixing. So as an example, if I had grown rice in this field last year, we would have had to fly airplanes over this field and dump nitrogen onto the ground to get the plants to grow. Well, an advantage of a legume, as I said, is it's nitrogen fixing. So the leaves of the plant literally take the nitrogen out of the air process it and through the roots of the plant they put the nitrogen back down in the soil. So it's a relatively easy and low-cost crop to grow and the nitrogen that's now in the soil that's been fixed into the soil is available for a crop that I can grow here next year. So it's got agricultural benefits. The third reason why I chose purple peas and, and the most important reason, it's the reason why we named our enterprise Healthy Flavors, is your health. So legumes, purple hole peas, are also an excellent source of protein. Most people, when they think about protein, it's the juicy hamburger you had or the T-bone steak. Well, plants can also be an excellent source of protein. Protein is important in growing your body. And as students, your bodies are growing right now, so you need protein. It's also an important element in healing your body, right? So, so protein is a very important part of our health and plants can be an excellent source of protein. And when those plants are grown right here in your community, that protein is fresher, available. It's not been put through heavy processing. You know, it's, it's basically there for you to consume and for your body to take care of. And that's why we named our business Healthy Flavors Arkansas. So in the next few minutes, I want to give you a little bit of a tour around the farm, show you some of the equipment that was involved in uh, the peas that you're studying and that you'll have the opportunity to eat in the cafeteria and just give you a, a little tour of the farm. So one of the reasons we don't have too many people living on farms, working on farms anymore is because of technology. Uh, this is not the newest technology, but it is the tractor that we use to uh, grow the peas that you're studying and, uh, and eating in the cafeteria. It's a fairly mighty machine, a Massey Ferguson 4263. Um, mighty, I say, because it's got 99 horsepower. So um, you know, in old days, they would size up a tractor by how many horses it was the equivalent of, 99 horsepower machine. Um, and I thought you all would be interested in this uh, fact. This machine was built in 1994. So well before uh, any of you were, were even born, but uh, a lot of farm equipment is well made and um, is put through the test over the decades. This is what we call a four row planter. 
and so pulled by the, the tractor. Um, it is the way we get uh, large quantities of, of pea plants uh, started. The pea seeds go into this hopper, and then based on uh, the spacing that you set through all the gear drives uh, that are located here, the pea seeds fall out and a furrow is created by those two round discs. So the soil is just opened up a trench, the pea seed is dropped inside, and then the trench is closed. There were four plantings of peas at different times, all around one acre. Planting began in June last year, although it would be possible to start planting in late April in central Arkansas. Depending on soil moisture and temperature, it can take anywhere from three days to a week for the seeds to germinate and for tiny plants to emerge. The peas are watered with poly or plastic pipe. The 8-inch pipe is filled with lots of water and holes are poked where we want water to run down the rows. Depending on the variety, purple hole peas may take from 55 to 70 days to go from germination to maturity, when they will be ready for picking. The variety grown here is called pink eye topic because the pods with peas all form at the top of the plant. That makes them easier to pick, but also possible to pick efficiently with the pea picker. You know the pods are ready when they turn the purple color you see in the photos. These peas matured in about 60 days. During harvesting, the tractor pulls the harvester along the row of pea plants. The plants enter from the front of the machine and go through a turning drum, which pulls the pods from the pea plants. The peas then move up a conveyor belt and into the bags. The person at the back of the machine filters out the leaves and stems to the best of their ability. To go from pod to pea, the sacks harvested in the field are emptied into a pea harvester like this. The drum turns and literally beats the pods open until the peas inside fall out. The shelled peas are then placed in this sorter, which sifts out small sticks and trash and cleans the peas. Then, the peas are sorted by hand to ensure that only high quality peas remain before packaging. Finally, the peas are packed into Ziploc bags and loaded into the freezer for storage. Hey there, it's Dan Spatz from Healthy Flavors Arkansas again. Hope you've enjoyed this little expose on how the purple hole peas got from our field onto your plates. I'm so excited to be working with all of your schools in this farm to school program and hope you enjoy those peas. Thank you. Okay, so um, that was the video that the, the kids saw and it gives you a little bit more um, uh, of, a, of an idea of, the, of our operation and, and what we're doing. And um, Samantha, Carolyn, you wanna kind of show one more video. Uh, this uh, shows more the final result. It was um, put together by some of the cafeteria staff in the, in the Greenbrier uh, School District. Yeah, that's me with the TikTok video. Yes. All right. Okay. Sound in there. Yeah, I just need to put there we go. So, uh, so yeah, that's the uh, the final result. Which just every time I see it, it, it yeah really makes me feel like you're you're having an impact. And uh, uh, all of the feedback was was marvelous. Um, Sophia Hogan, the nutrition director in in Bologna, she was like literally, you know, the kids are coming back into the cafeteria asking for seconds, and uh, she was just like really thrilled about that. Um, you know, 
very rarely if ever happens. And and so what we've known for a long time, you know, and 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 I did alerts kind of pulling together the grant, uh, you know, we know that when you engage kids in the food and you show them where it's coming from, how it's grown, uh, you know, it's it just it gets them interested and it has an impact and um, you know very much in a in a data oriented and research oriented sort of way. Uh, when these programs have been studied, it's um, it, it can be very impactful. Um, you know, at the with obesity, with the immune system, with with all sorts of things. So. Um, just uh, having that opportunity has been a, been a real blessing. Um, I guess, would we wanna open up for questions now? Yes, <clears throat> well, um, <clears throat> and I have a question for you uh, related to the partnerships that you formed. Could you provide a little bit more detail about who are your partners and what were their involvement in this process? Yeah, for, for, for sure, I could not have done this without uh, Unifil Arkansas. And, and I have to say that uh, Dr. Nina Roof, um, nutrition and family sciences there, you know, they are, I, I was, I didn't realize the extent to which they were already plugged into uh, Farm to School as a, as a program. Um, in, the, in Arkansas, there is a, um, uh, a law that requires institutions that receive state money to report on the amount of local uh, food content um, on their menus. Um, and so I think UCA had been involved with some of the districts on those kinds of, of challenges. I think UCA had been involved. I know UCA had, had done a number of plate waste studies on various programs, but um, you know, their ability, their, their relationships with each of the nutrition directors that we wound up working with proved extremely valuable. And then the, the relationships that I formed with um, uh, Krista Stevens at Mayflower and, and, and Kristen uh, Hogan and Greenbrier. And, you know, I mean, it's just been, it's been a whole experience, um, you know, like a lot of things, right? When you take on a challenge, you um, for them, for the nutrition directors, you know, they don't necessarily do a lot of cooking in uh, in the cafeterias these days. So just making sure that they've got the right equipment, you know, the uh, I think we were uh, well set up. Um, both Greenbrier and Bologna have a, a walk-in freezer, which might not be necessarily the case uh, at a district, but. Um, but they had that equipment and then Mayflower didn't, it's a smaller district. So uh, we took care of them um, uh, along the way. Um, but then, you know, uh, I think the relationships with the, the kids when I got to go visit the schools and, and they're like, wow, you're the farmer in, in the video, you know, those kinds of uh, things were awesome. Um, and then we had a, we had a couple of graduate uh, research assistants at UCA that really helped with the recipe development, they pulled the lesson plans. And so that's been, uh, been very filling as well. So what kind of lesson plans were involved in the classroom related to your piece? Um, so every lesson plan kind of got started with the video uh, that you saw. Um, for the third graders, it was uh, more location specific. And, you know, they were studying the maps and, and where the lolly bottoms is and in relation to their districts and things like that. Um, for the seventh graders, it was, uh, and, and also for the 10th graders, it was a little bit more health oriented. Um, so they were getting into more of a, you know, I talked about protein in the video, they were getting into more discussions about proteins, carbohydrates and, and fats and, and different things like that. Um, we did, and I'm trying to remember now, we pulled together a whole variety of, of farm to school curriculums that are available out there and that have been tried and tested. Um, and if you're interested, I could get to you the name of the ones we use, but we, we did that survey and selected the one that we thought was most adaptable um, to, to this and, and also just rich in content. Um, so, there's a lot of resources out there and we didn't want to reinvent the wheel um, where we didn't have to. Okay. Um, so 
when it comes to farm to school and getting local foods into schools, one of our um, biggest barriers that we have found is price points. A lot of school nutrition programs, they source their products wholesale. So when you have a local farmer competing with wholesale prices, of course, at the end of the day, more than, more than likely that local good will be more expensive than a wholesale product. So what are some creative strategies that you used to help kind of offset that cost, but also have this be an asset to your farm business? Yeah, that, that, is, that is a very, very important question. And, and my top of mind and unflinching answer is farm to school grant money. <laughs> um, you know, this initiative was not my first attempt. So, so Conway, um, Conway is an education oriented town and we've got three colleges in town. And so I had started this transition I spoke of uh, three years earlier. And we did it really on the back of supplying a food cooperative in Little Rock that in the course of us doing business with them went bankrupt. And then, so then we turned around and we went and said, well, where do we go next? And so we were selling, um, we were selling food to Hendricks College. Uh, so to one of the local college cafeterias and we had a sale to um, the Conway public schools. And, and exactly what you're um, talking about, Samantha, is a challenge, right? And what I found was the school directors do have leeway on how much they'll pay. And I found them amazingly willing to pay more than what their wholesalers um, would charge them in, you know, up to an extent. So there are restrictions and limitations on uh, the, the funds that they can um, spend without having to go through a bid process. But even at that point, I found them um, willing to you know, create the bids and the specs in a way that would, would favor local foods. I, I think the nutrition directors, at least the ones I've met in central Arkansas, are very, very interested in these programs. However, brass tacks. You know, I could see early on that this was not going to be a sustainable relationship if I couldn't figure out a way to scale. And, and that's the other part of my answer. Um, I think to do this on a long term basis, you need to be really um, cognizant and aware of the scalability of what you're doing. And some of my earlier learning from the farming perspective was instead of doing 15, 20 different crops to try to meet a school need or at one point we were going to do a CSA you know I, I just found that almost overwhelming so COVID hit in March of 2020 I had to take a break I unfortunately had to let the guy that I was farming with uh, go but the silver lining out of that was it gave me time and space to step back and kind of contemplate the question that you're raising and I and I thought it you know, I'm, I'm probably not going to make it if I don't find a way to scale. And then lo and behold, the farm to school program came along and I thought, well, if I focus on one crop and I do it on scale, then I've got a lot better chance of, of hitting some price points that are competitive. And even at that, I alluded to working with small school districts in the beginning. So the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff was very helpful. They have a um, field trial study on purple whole peas, uh, different varieties. And, you know, we, we will be targeting, um, you know, 1400 pounds of shelled peas per acre. That's what we want to get to. Our first year run, pounds per acre. So we went, for, we're going from four, four acres of at 550 pounds per acre this year we're going to be doing 30 acres and our target is a thousand pounds per acre. And, and we learned to control, <laughs> even though I could with that harvester, um, you know, we, we've learned a lot. And so this year we want to go to 30 acres and a thousand pounds per acre. 
and then we'll learn something this crop season that, that hopefully gives us line of sight to that, you know, um, field trials study of, of 15, 1600 pounds an acre. But the, e the economics of this and doing it competitively are very much in my mind tied to scale. And because of the risk involved um, in doing things on scale, you know, I was just very grateful that, that the USDA grant came along, made that possible. Um, so yeah, that, that would be my, my answer to that question. So you, I mean, obviously to convert your farm into a purple hole production farm, you had to have equipment to be able to do that. So how did the USDA grant help offset those costs and were there other costs incurred that maybe you, you didn't consider when applying for the grant that you found out while you were in it? Um, yes, yeah, certainly I, um, I personally had to spring for, you know, like I bought the tractor, right? I bought the planter, you know, we were, we were getting into the game and those were, were, were costs that the USDA didn't cover. Um, but, but I had to, uh, make sure that, that we were, were ready to do that. Um, <laughs> the cost of everything in, in COVID times was one kind of um, surprise and even just the availability in COVID times was another surprise. So, you know, my idea was we would be able to shell and, and, and freeze, store the peas um, year one. Um, that didn't play out. So what I did do is I quickly figured out that Alcorn State University has a vegetable processing facility in Marks. So uh, Percy Baldwin there, you know, godsend, just he, he made it all possible. So we trucked the peas over to Marks uh, this past year. So again, that's extra expense. And I have found the USDA to be very forgiving um, and very acceptable kind of in, in moving pots of money around within the grant. Um, I, I kind of, it was my first grant experience. I was thinking, you know, obviously you want to do what you said you would do. Um, I found as long as you were, you know, meeting the broad expectations, producing peas, we were selling them to the schools, you know, those kinds of things. They've, they've been very easy to work with. So um, did you have, did you buy any of the processing equipment, like the, the, the pea husker, the, the, the sheller, and then the sorter? And then of course you had to have a freezer on site. What, what were those, some of those elements that you needed to, to get your systems up and run, running? So, so, you know, I looked as I was formulating the grant, I looked at what would be allowable and what would not be allowable. And it was pretty clear that the, uh, the sheller and the uh, harvester and the freezer would all be allowable expenses. But they're not. They're, this particular grant is not going to build bricks and mortar. It's not going to build the shed that I needed to house that equipment. So, um, so I've gone elsewhere for uh, for those um, uh, types of infrastructure. Um, and then uh, this is a hundred thousand dollar up to a hundred thousand dollar implementation grant. So um, they have different types of grants, but um, this was an implementation grant up to hundred thousand. And obviously what I was doing was I was, um, it was trying to hit all of the elements of farm to school. So um, the partnership with UCA, funding the graduate assistants, funding the, the lesson plans. Now, a lot of this um, wasn't that costly, like producing the video, you know, that was pretty easy. You wanted to graduate assistants, her husband turns out to be kind of involved in producing videos and stuff like that. So we did things on the fly. Um, and then the big cost were, as I said, the sheller, the freezer, and the um, harvester. And then you add all those budget elements up and you go, oops, this is going to cost more than. <laughs> so um, so the, the thing about a farm to school grant is you've got matching in kind requirements. And that matching in kind requirement was me putting money into this venture because they paid for 70% of the farm um, infrastructure, and I, I'm covering the remaining 30%. So that was the way, that was the way the budget um, worked on the on the, um, uh, on the on the grant side. And then I'm I'm doing this long term, right? I mean, I we, we sold the piece to the schools. Um, I'm not making any money in in year one. In fact, we're taking eight thousand dollars and we're reinvesting that in another graduate assistant. Uh, 
student at UCA next year, but my challenge is to get my yields up and get the price point right and get, you know, you know become profitable. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping we can turn some profit in year two, um, certainly by year three as we, as we continue to scale this thing and continue to learn. Um, Dan, I have a question. And so you had mentioned, do you exclusively sell to schools or do you have um, any kind of contracts with, you know, farmers markets or restaurants or other areas? Um, so we don't. On, on this program, my objective is to first and foremost prove the economic model that I'm talking about, which is kind of this closed loop and sustainable economic model. I, I'm, I'm wanting to prove that uh, with school system. Um, I would say, I would say we also got lucky uh, with this being COVID year in that there was a lot of unexpected federal money that came to the school programs. And so back to the question about relationships, boy, was, you know, having good relationships with the child nutrition directors, being very transparent and open with them, you know, here's our yield, here's how much we grew, you know, and, and then we proportion the peas out to each of the districts based on their population, meals served and things like that. And then, and then they step forward. I mean, they, they have a financial stake in this um, as well. They, they basically paid for that, that graduate assistant um, um, for next year. Um, so, so all of that worked, uh, all of that worked really, really well. And um, we're gonna sit down uh, in May, uh, kind of towards the end of the year, and, and we're going to make another run. And then, as I said, I'm targeting, well, we, I've got, we got the seeds, we'll start uh, planting up to 30 acres in, in May. Um, we will work for sure with Greenbrier, Bologna, and Mayflower. I am talking with Conway and North Little Rock as well, which are bigger districts. So I'd like to have a better game plan going into next year, one where you know, I'm more certain and they're more certain, but, you know, if, if we have some spare peas left over, that was the other advantage of picking purple whole peas. I've heard over and over and over again, whether it's Kroger, whether it's, um, you know, we do business here in Tennessee with Fresh Point, you know, there are not enough purple whole peas on the market in the summertime to meet demand. So if I get into a situation where um, the schools are fully absorbed on what I can produce in that area, I will face a decision, but I'm pretty comfortable economically that I, I think I can find a home for the peas. Farmer's market or something like that. So um, do you have any maybe tips or tricks that you could share with farmers who um, are interested in possibly testing out these waters on, on their farmland? Um, what, what would be some, some tips for them? You know, I would I would just say, um, yeah, I found the schools to be great customers, um, very motivated uh, for these types of programs. And, you know, versus my earlier experiences selling to a cooperative where, um, yeah, it might have been more secure in, on the one hand. They had a published price list of what they were paying. You know, we signed up with a quantity. Uh, I, I've just found the school districts to be easier to do business with, you know, not requiring that contract, um, those kinds of things. Um, and then, um, you know, um, if, if you're if you're uncertain about how much you can grow, if it's a new crop or whatever, you know, think about partnering up or if you're if you're finding that, um, you know, maybe the districts want more than you think you can grow. Um, you know, I've got I've got farmers that are nearby us in the lolly bottoms that are, are looking at what we're doing and and would like to get in on the game. You know, so um, I think the kind of partnership. You know, reach out to your extension service and UAPB. I mentioned on the on the P side of things have, have been great. Um, you know, I think most farmers are fairly conservative with your finances, so don't overextend yourself because they're going to be all the unknowns and unexpected twists and turns, um, but that's pretty normal in agriculture. I mean, it's, uh, it does take a, a level of risk and a, 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 to, to step outside of doing what you've always done. Um, so, yeah. 
what about some um, food safety measures? What what um, kind of safety and liability measures do you have in place? So um, again, another advantage, great question. And another advantage of, of the farm to school, I think at a certain scale, because none of them necessarily require that. Mm -hmm. So when I talk about much longer range plans that I'm developing, for local horticulture in Conway, I'm talking to Aramark, for example. And now you're talking multi-million dollar liability policies and, and things like that. And I think that's good practice. Um, you know, I, I'm pretty sure that we'll get there. Um, and, and, and then we, um, we have a, a team member, Maddie Fortune, she's a student at UCA. She went up to uh, Fayetteville and the, uh, we have, a, in Arkansas, we've got the Food Conservancy, uh, which is making a lot of investments in local food. They run a uh, food safety and, and hygiene course. So Maddie has um, been up there to study those requirements. And for this coming year, her task is going to be to implement food safety and hygiene in the processing shed that we're building on the farm there in Conway. So, so I very much encourage all of that. I think there is a, uh, relationship to your scale where there, where that's either required or not required. And again, the reason I think the schools are an excellent entry point for beginning farmers is that they're not necessarily requiring that. Mm -hmm. But it's always good to follow good agricultural practices. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and again, the benefit I had here was that we were taking them over to Mark, Alcorn State, and they're fully compliant with all of that. So I didn't have to worry about that, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, um, let's open up the floor to um, our guests. Do, does anybody have any questions for Mr. Spatz? Uh, Samantha, I've got just a few. Uh, first, I want to say thank you, uh, Samantha. I appreciate you um, arranging for Dan to do this. Very, very informative. And Dan, thank you for sharing your story um, with us today and being so agreeable. <laughs> to do that. We've got two questions primarily. I'm curious whether you have any similar production uh, of purple hull peas or other products in Tennessee. I know you've got farms in both states, but I'm, and I know most of your production in Tennessee is probably you know, indoor, but uh, I, I wasn't real sure if you had any similar production uh, in Tennessee. And my next question has to do primarily with uh, the experience you've shared regarding the processing, and you've really hit most of that, but I'm, I'm curious if there are if there was any flexibility on behalf of the schools in terms of the way they receive the peas, can they only uh, receive them already hauled and processed, or is there any option for them to receive them, if you will, fresh and and they um, and they haul them, so to speak? Question. Um, so, on your first one, yeah, our 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 farm and. Uh, Eagleville uh, south of Nashville is uh, entirely dedicated to culinary herbs and we grow in, in greenhouses and um, we're expanding into hoop houses and into field production uh, with some of the crops um, but yeah we grow uh, 11 different varieties of, of culinary herbs here there you go yeah and um, and I'll bridge your question about um, the processing by starting in Tennessee, I, my, my observation, and, and we've been doing this, my wife and I, Nadia, about 10 years, um, we bought this operation here and, you know, we're our, and our clients here are Walmart and Cisco. So I, I sometimes say we're too small to be big and too big to be small, we're kind of in between. Um, but I'm, you know, from the economic perspective, and, and, and I, I had a 20 year career with the Mars Corporation, so I'm not your classic farmer. I'm always looking at things from that financial and, and economic perspective. But um, <laughs> I, it's hard for me to fathom thinking about doing things without some value add. And whether it's taking the herbs after harvest and, and, and the value add here is cleaning, sorting, and then putting them into the pack that, that Samantha showed, you know, that is, a, that is a form of value add that allows us to um, create a margin stream that, that adds value for Walmart, right? That's what it looks like on the shelf at, at Walmart. Um, when it comes to the peas in 
um, Arkansas and getting to know the challenges of a school food service program, oh my goodness. These ladies are pulling off miracles every single day. And I invited Sophia Hogan, the nutrition director in Bologna, to be a part of this. But, you know, she had, they had, they had severe weather in central Arkansas the last two nights. And she's got people that are out, you know, cafeteria manager. She's out on the serving line today. So she really couldn't afford to be here. And, you know, we got into this with them in COVID times. Now, <laughs> that's been a blessing and a curse. I mean, the curse is, is that they've had very little time to dedicate to, the development of a program like this, um, just getting them on the phone, you know, the, the kind of coordination calls and, and, and logistics and things necessary to, to pull this off, you know, they have been stretched to the hilt, right? And so now the, the blessing has been that they have wanted our, our peas, right? They have needed our peas because they have difficulty every single day sourcing the basic ingredients that would go into these meal plans. So, so they've, not only been willing to work with us and they want to work with us and um, and the and the COVID times have shown the fragilities of the supply chain, but they've been willing to pay more for it, right? Now they've had the finances to do that. So I don't think that's going to go on, but but my key point there is really having the value add to get those peas to them and and in a in a prepared fashion where all they needed to do was take those five gallon um, Ziploc bags reconstitute them overnight and then and then put them into the pan I, I i don't think that you know now now i'm a i'm a social entrepreneur right so the entrepreneurial side of me and i've people say dan maybe those pods to like a a, a retirement facility where people want to you know and, and the older people remember those days of, of shelling peas I don't know if that would really work in the school system. I know it would not work in the cafeteria given their their demands, but but I love the creativity. Did that answer your question? Yes, very good. Thank you. Yeah, I just some sort of value add in agriculture, and I know I know you don't have to have that in row crops necessarily, but but then you're you're probably doing several hundred, if not several thousand acres of row crops to to have margin to, to survive economically. So. And I did, I did actually um, run some numbers. Uh, uh, when we do beans this year, obviously this is a, an exceptional year as well, but you know, you're looking at, at booking beans at $15 a, a bushel. You know, if we can get, if we can get 50 bushels an acre, um, you know, you're looking at eight, $830 of revenue per acre on your classic uh, soybean. You know, we'll be targeting $5,600 an acre top line revenue on purple hole peas. And we really should eventually be targeting $7,000 an acre. That's top line revenue. Now you've, you've got all the other costs of getting started, but that shows you the, the power, back to the, the, the economic power of this from the farming perspective um, of getting into some of these specialty crops. Um, you know, there's more involved, there's more knowing your customer, there's more capital involved. Um, but that's why I think the, the future of farming, you know, the next 50 years, if we can get, if we can square that equation, right, get more healthy food uh, to our communities and, and, and have the mutuality of that benefiting the farming community economically, you know, to me, that's win, win, win. Sam, you're on mute. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yeah, okay, sorry. <laughs> I think one of the beneficial things that you have done, Dan, is you have thought out of the box. And it is true that farmers can apply for farm to school grants. And there are lots of other grants available too that farmers are able to apply for, but also approaching school districts and saying, hey, do you want to partner with me? And then they could also apply for those grants and support your farm business. Um, Mr. Holland, you are more um, aware of resources that farmers can be connected with. Would you be able to share just a couple off the top of your head, I know like the Tennessee Specialty Crop Grant is one that's $25,000. Um, are there any other resources that farmers are able to tap into to, to support uh, an endeavor such as this one? 
Well, I'll, I'll mention maybe a few and, and uh, some may be more broad than others, but certainly there's some, uh, in addition to the specialty crop block grant, there's some opportunities with the Tennessee Department of Agriculture uh, and some funding programs that they have. There are uh, through USDA, a few that come to mind. One would be through the, or potentially uh, through the uh, Sustainable Ag Research and Education Program, uh, SAIR. And then the other one that comes to mind would be through USDA Rural Development. There's a value added producer grant. So um, every one of those funding programs is gonna have some real specific objectives and they're gonna have a real specific list of things that are qualified expenses that can be, the funding can be used on. But uh, those are a few that uh, over the years have been uh, heavily utilized uh, to help uh, farmers in Tennessee uh, expand or in, in some cases um, venture into some value added uh, activities, I'll say. Um, it's not always processing, but sometimes it's more of a, of a marketing angle. Um, so there are some resources that are available there. It, uh, it, it depends on the details, the specific details of the agency and specifically what the farmer wants to do. But those are a few examples. Another one I'd mention, or do we need to wrap up? I don't know if people have a hard stop, but well, the we'll healthy food financing initiative. A couple more minutes longer and then, and then we'll wrap up, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'd, I'd throw in there the healthy food financing initiative. Um, which more targeted to retail. I think the last seven, eight years, they've been focused on building up retail capacity in food deserts where um, you know, the commercial grocery trade is, is kind of pulling out. But this was the first funding cycle that they opened up for producers. And to, to Rob's point, you know, the, you, have, you have to be very aware of what they're willing to fund and not willing to fund and, and requirements. But, um, uh, but over in Arkansas, again, I partnered with the uh, Arkansas Coalition for Obesity Prevention and the Confess Project, and we're going to be um, hopefully getting some purple whole peas. That's back to Carolyn's point. I mean, I am thinking beyond school, but uh, getting some butternut squash going um, into retail stores where Double Up Food Bucks um, incentivizes the fresh local produce um, consumption and then the Confess Project is pretty cool. You ought to look it up. They train African-American uh, barbers in mental health, but they're actually going to expand that training into health and nutrition, advertise double up food bucks, uh, make people aware that the produce, the local produce is available in, in these retail locations. So um, that, another big advantage of that one is it doesn't require a match and they're willing to fund brick and mortar. So that's good. Excellent. Well, um, does anybody have any other questions for Dan? Um, okay, well, I'm, I'm sharing my screen real quick because I just wanted to remind everyone that on our website, nwtnlfn.org, um, you can find more information about the school meal waivers bill. Um, and what is that about, about supporting universal school lunches for, um, for all children all throughout the United States of America. Um, there, is, um, there are links, you can link to the online petition form. That's an easy, quick fill out a petition, it takes a minute. Or you can download our postcard and advocacy kit um, that includes um, the templates for the postcards and also labels to Tennessee legislatures. Um, and uh, Caroline had made some writing postcard uh, prompts. It has more information about what the waivers are and, and so forth. So, so please check this out and please spread the word. Um, we want as many signatures as possible because this is really, really important not only for children, but for school nutrition programs, because as Dan has said, the school nutrition directors are, you know, putting their pedal to the metal, <laughs> their foot to the pedal, or that's what it's called. Anyway, every, every single day, they work really hard for the benefit of our children, and all of our children should have access to food. Um, it's a universal right, food, we all, we all need food to live. Um, the other thing we have going on is um, we have our Grow Food Challenge that's about to kick off on April 23rd. Our grand prize for this challenge and participating and uploading photos of what you're growing and food waste is a Ruler King freezer full of 
Giffen Farms local beef. <laughs> so thank you, Derek Giffen, for that donation. It's going to be an awesome prize. That is a good carrot to get people to just plant a pot of lettuce and take a picture of it. Um, so we have three categories, start, grow, and harvest. Each of those include uh, two uploads of photos, one of what you're growing, the other of what you're composting. And once you submit it, you are eligible to not only win the grand prize, but several themed prizes throughout this challenge. The challenge takes place from April 23rd to June 18th. And we're gonna kick it off at the Martin Farmer's Market um, with a free seed distribution and a plant and pot swap um, on April 23rd from 10 to 12 at the Martin Farmer's Market. And then we're gonna celebrate um, at the Martin Farmer's Market on Saturday, June 18th. And we will share who's the big winner. <laughs> um, so yes, please dig into our website. We have lots of farm to school resources, especially when it comes to local food procurement. Um, any, you know, <clears throat> any tips and tricks, you can just kind of dig in there and find it. Um, but I wanted to thank Dan Spack. Okay. All right, Sam, you cut off, but uh, yes. And now you're on mute. Okay. Thank you. I love thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all very much. <laughs> all, right. all right. Bye. Thank you, Caroline. Thanks, Dan. You're welcome. <laughs> Bye.